I'd like to assure you that your offering will be used in the upbuilding of God's kingdom. And uh, I'd like to also take just a moment to say Happy Father's Day to each and every individual in here. I uh, hope and pray that, that you have a good day. Uh, the Lord has, has blessed this day. It's a beautiful day outside, and, and uh, especially the fathers. But I hope and pray everybody has a good day here today. Uh, Looking forward to Vacation Bible School that, that starts tonight. Um, I don't know who put the names on the monkeys, but I can't argue with any of them. Uh, so we'll just leave it at that. Sorry, Jimmy, I can't defend you. Uh, or anybody else. Or myself. Um, Second Corinthians. I'd like to go there today in, in uh, chapter 5. Mm -hmm. 2 Corinthians, and I'd like to read a few verses here before Brother Joe brings the message. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, beginning with verse 6. It says, Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. This is the Apostle Paul that had written this. And uh, he's, he's saying here that, that he knows that being in this body means that we're absent from the Lord. Uh, Paul was one that, that had been beaten on many occasions. He was stoned and left for dead. And basically, for him, if somebody were to do away with his life, it's not going to make things any, any worse for him than it is at, at that point in time. It would put him in the presence of the Lord. That's how he was able to endure all these difficult things. He knew that when he left this life, he would be with the Lord. So it was a great comfort to him to know that. For we walk by faith, not by sight. In Hebrews 1, we're told faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. A few verses later in that same chapter, we're told that without faith we cannot please him. But we must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Those that really seek the Lord, and we need to diligently seek him by faith. We need to do all we can for the Lord because we know that when we leave this life that we'll be present with the Lord. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Again, Paul is saying that, that he knows when he's absent from this body, from this physical body, he'll be present with the Lord. In Philippians, Paul mentioned in verse, uh, beginning verse 23 there in Philippians chapter 1, Paul wrote, for I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. We need to be ready to go and meet the Lord. But at the same time, we have friends, we have relatives, there are people in this life that we come in contact with that don't know the Lord. And we need to be ministers for the Lord. We need to be witnesses for the Lord. A witness is somebody that, that shows people about Jesus Christ. If we have a hope of eternal life living in us, people can see that in us. If we live for the Lord, they can see that. And that is a great witness right there. You know, a couple ladies from this congregation that uh, when they were sick and, and, and dying and, and one of them made the comment you know that, that she didn't know why the Lord was keeping her around the other one several times said she thought the Lord forgot about her a couple of the greatest witnesses I've ever seen when you go in to visit them they wanted to talk about the Lord they were laying on their deathbed but they wanted to talk about the Lord they were still telling people about Jesus, still being a witness for him, still bringing people to Christ. Verse 9, wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. We continue to labor for him. We live our lives for him. We seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that which he hath done, whether good or bad. People say works really don't mean anything. That's not what Paul said here. 
It's whether that's what's going to judge us. In, in the book of Revelation, we're told we'll be judged by our works. It's whether they're good or whether they're bad. We're going to be judged accordingly, and there's only two places we're going to go. To those that do good for the Lord, He will say, He will welcome us as good and faithful servants. And those that do evil will be sent to everlasting damnation. We've got those two choices. And it's how we live our lives that determine that. We have to give our lives to Christ. We have to be obedient to His Word and, and, and do what He tells us to to become Christians. And then we have to continue to live as Christians. But we need to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness so that all these things will be added unto us. This time, Brother Joe, bring message. Thank you, Brother Dan. And a good message right there, just within itself. Uh, I'd like to, first of all, again, this morning, thank uh, the Lord for giving me this opportunity to be able to come back out and share His Word with you all again. Uh, if you want to, take your hymn books and turn them to 629. And I know this is not night. This is a why not tonight. It's, uh, it's one of our invitation song today. And just put them at your side up there. And I'd like for you to go to Colossians chapter 2. That's where we'll take my reading from today. And what Dan said there just goes right along with everything. That's what I was going to talk about a little bit today. Or try to. And I want to back up. I, I started want to start in verse, the first verse of uh, chapter 2. Too, but I decided to back up just a little bit, or maybe the Lord decided I needed to back up just a little bit, and go back into Colossians chapter 1, starting with the 25th verse. And this is another letter from Paul to the Colossians here. Actually, if you read over in verse 1, it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. So it could be two of them, but Paul was one doing a writing here, I believe. <coughs> And then it says, Wherefore, and I'm going to read just a little bit before I go to jumping around much, and I'm not trying not to jump too troubling much as we go down through here, but I've got quite a bit of reading to do. It says, Wherefore, I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mysteries which have been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. The gospel at one time or the ministry was hidden from a lot of people. The ministry, not necessarily the gospel. But as we go on down through here in a little bit, we're going to find out how we can find that mystery. But as Brother Dan said a few minutes ago, it takes work to do that. It don't just happen. Whether we do good or whether we do bad, it takes work. So we have, to, we have to realize we've got a job to do here with this. To whom God, verse 27 of chapter 1 says, To whom God would make known that is the riches of the glory of his mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. To whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his workings, which worketh in me mine. Paul was acknowledging right here that it wasn't just his working, but it was Jesus as Christ is working through him. And that's what we are today as, as individual Christians today. It's not us doing the work of God. It's us doing God's, wor uh, God's work through us. It's his working through us that makes us the person that we are if we're a devout Christian. If we're wanting to do what he wants us to do, we have to let Christ into our heart. We have to let Christ with, dwell within us and within our body so that we can be the servant that he wants us to be. It says in, in chapter 2, it's for, <clears throat> for I would that ye know what great conflict I have for you, and for them that want to see it, and for the, as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. These people that Paul had wrote to that actually hadn't even seen him. And Paul did have a lot of afflictions. 
And he had a lot of affliction because he was a saint of God, because he was a Christian, because he was putting the word of God out into the world. He at once, as Saul of Tarsus, tried to destroy the church. Then on the road to Damascus, he seen the light. God revealed it to him. He knew who that was that blinded him at that point in time. Then he was told later on what to do about it. And he accepted Christ as his Lord and Savior. That way he was, a, he was one of the ministry. Even the minister that went to him knowed about what kind of life Saul Tarsus had done. He knew that if he went to him, he was likely to get punished, get thrown in prison. He, he told God, that told the angel, said, that, I don't want to go there. Because he's afraid what might happen to him. But God revealed to that that went to him saying, Paul is going to have to go through a lot of afflictions. Just because we have afflictions in this life doesn't mean we give up on God. God's not going to give up on us. But we don't need to give up on Him either just because we have afflictions. In verse 2 it says, That their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and to, and, and to all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. All the wisdom and knowledge that we need today is hidden in Christ. And I think I've made this point before, and I know I've heard this point made before here in the pulpit, is that if you've not got Christ in your heart, you cannot understand what His Word tells you. What the gospel tells you, if you've not accepted the, the, Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you can read the words of this book, but you don't have the Spirit indwelling within you to be able to acknowledge, you know what the Word says, but know what it means. There's only one way of doing that, and that's for Jesus Christ to reveal it to you through His Word. If you don't have Him in your heart, you can't get it revealed to you. You can read the words and you think you understand it. I think I understand a lot of things until it is it's made more plainer to me. But you have to have Christ in your heart in order to understand what it is. It says in verse 3, In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. It's all right here. All the treasure of wisdom and knowledge is in his book right here in front of us today. It's how do we obtain it. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. And I thought about that, uh, uh, beguile you with enticing words, and, and we've got a BBS this week coming up with a jungle. And the jungle's got a lot of mysterious things in it, a lot of things that's hiding, that you don't know what's around the next bend or what's in the little dark corners in the, in the deep part of the jungle. We don't understand it. And sometimes we're afraid to go in there. In God's Word, if we've got Jesus Christ in our heart, we should be able to go into all the different areas and find out what we need to do to become a Christian, what we need to do to stay that, to, to uh, remain that faithful Christian, and what we need to do as an individual to help others along the way. As it said up there in verse 2, together in love, we will have that love that we need in our heart with Christ in us. It says, and this I say, verse 4 says, and this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. We'll know what those enticing words are if we look into God's word and let him lead and guide and direct us. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joining and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Paul was joyful with these here at uh, Galatian because he knows, he says, beholding order, the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. He had, he had talked or read about uh, and wrote the letter to them and talked to others from there, and he knows that their steadfastness in Christ, that they had to be steadfast in Christ. We today have to be steadfast in Christ Jesus, not in beguiling words from, enticing words from the world, but in Christ Jesus is where we need to be steadfast. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk ye in him. The only way we can walk in, in the Lord Jesus Christ is in through his word. For his mysteries, have, we got to get into those. And listen here in verse 7. Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. 
as faith was what Dan talked about just a few minutes ago. We've got to do it with faith in Jesus Christ. Go to his word and he'll tell us what we need to know. Will we get the answer right quickly? No, not necessarily, maybe sometimes. I have searched and searched uh, different times for things that would be troubling me in my life and bothering me and it wouldn't get it just overnight. Sometimes he'd give it to me really quick. Sometimes I'd have to go a week, a week or two looking for it. But if I earnestly needed it, he gave it to me in his time through his power and his, and his wonderful works. Verse 8, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. I always did want to go out, especially when I was younger. Not so much maybe now as I did when I was younger, and maybe still a little bit now, but I want to know what somebody else thinks. And what do you think about this situation? What do you think about it? We need to beware of that. Listen here. Verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. I like to read uh, good health books. But you've got to watch what you're reading. They might not be giving you what you need. I do know for surely that this Word of God is what we need. It's helped me a number of times. And I'm sure it can do the same for you. For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in Him, which is the head of the all principality and power. And I want to make a few more points, just a few more minutes on what it says right there. And ye are complete in him, that is Christ, which is the head of all principalities and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with a circ circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Of putting the old body before we become a Christian away in a watery grave. And I'll read about this. Let me just go on down to verse 12 real quick. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. And real quickly, let's run over to Romans verse 6, or I mean chapter 6, verse 3 through 12. I'll read that real quickly. Romans chapter 6, verse 3 says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ was baptized into his death. The writer here is right. Do you not understand that this is how we were baptized into his death? Wherefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. That's when we need to be changed over. We should have already done all this as we go through it, the watery grave. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, how did he die? He died on a cruel cross. He was put in the ground. We shall also in the likeness of his resurrection. He come back that third and appointed day that it was prophesied through the prophets back in the Old Testament even. We've got to go through the same thing it's a it's, it's a implement type uh, thing or a, a symbolic, symbolic type thing. As we go into that watery grave, we go down the old man and we become new. As we go on down there, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, and henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death have no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. As we become a Christian, we live unto God. We don't need to be going out here and getting all these things from the world. Yeah, we have to live in this world, and we have to uh, we have to go ahead and survive in this world, but we don't have to partake of this world. It says, likewise, reckon ye also yourselves be the dead, be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us not let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. 
we have changed ourselves, or not, we have not changed ourselves. The Lord has changed us when he has knocked upon our door and we have accepted him as our Lord and Savior. He has changed us into a new creature. And that's what Paul was writing here to the Colossians and telling them. Buried with him in verse 12, buried with him in baptism, wherein also we are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, not of ourselves, it's the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. God raised Christ. God will raise us and keep us straight if we will let him. But we are not a robot. I heard that, I think, on uh, Mac Lyon. We are not a robot. He will let us do what we want to do. We can either serve him or we can deny him. It's our choice. But we also have to pay the consequences for the choice we make. And you being dead, in verse 13, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwritten of ordinances that were against us, which were contrary to us, and taking it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. These were things that we just could not hold to that could save our soul and give us salvation. Jesus Christ took them away for us. When he was under the law, and that's what Jesus Christ lived under. And I want to look over real quickly at Luke uh, chapter 2, verse 21 and 22. He went all the way back. He went to everything that the law said, and he was perfect. No guy was found in his mouth. It says in verse uh, 21 and 22 uh, through 22 here in chapter 2 of Luke says and when eight days were accomplished for the circumcision of the child his name was called Jesus which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb and when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses was accomplished they brought him to Jerusalem and presented him unto the Lord that was Jesus Christ they had to go right back his parents had to go right back and do everything that the law said he was under the law. But we are no longer under that law. We're under the grace covenant. And that's what he's saying here in verse 14. Blotting out the handwritten of ordinances that were against us, which was contrary to us, and take it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. His cross. Christ's cross. When we become a Christian... Christ took our sins, nailed them to that old rugged cross. That's why we take these sacred emblems every week to remember what he done for us. For every saint of God, for every Christian in this house, that should be the most solemn time they are. Is to remember what Christ our Lord and Savior did for each and every one of us. Whether we accept it or whether we deny it. He did it for us. And as a Christian, it should be the most, the most wonderful time to be able to commune with your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 15. And having spoiled principalities and power, he made a shoe of them openly, triumphing over them in it. When our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ went to that old rugged cross, he didn't necessarily want to go. You know how I know that? It's because it's wrote in his word that he prayed three times to, to God that this cup be passed from him. Three times he prayed. He knew what was coming up. He knew what he was going to have to go through. But you know what he said? Not my will, but thine be done. But look at this in verse uh, 15 again. It says, Having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a shoe of them openly, triumphing over them in it. And there's a lot of different places down through where I've got my uh, reference thing that I can go to, but I want to go to one place real quickly, and I hadn't looked at it before until, until uh, uh, this, uh, the Lord was putting this message together for me. Luke chapter 10, verses 17 through 20. 
Luke chapter 10, verses 17 through 20. It's talking about 70 here, and if you look back in the first part of the chapter, you'll talk about it talks about where he sent 70 um, um, disciples out, two by two, going into the different places. He told them what he was going to do. Now, when these 70 come back to him in verse 17, it says, And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Now, there was a time and place for this right here. They was able to go out, if you read back up there, they was able to go out and do a lot of things that would not harm them. But Christ told them what to do. If they went in and they didn't accept them, they was even to take the dust completely off of their, uh, off of them that they've got within that city. If that city decided they didn't want to hear nothing of Jesus Christ, they was to even shake the dust completely off of them. Shun them completely, get it away from them. But there wasn't nothing to help them or to hurt them. It says 17, and the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. It wasn't through them, not the, not the, uh, the uh, 70 that he sent out, but it was through Jesus, or through thy name. And what in 18, and he said unto them, the Lord speaking, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of, of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now listen to this. Now this is to the 70 again. Because I'm sure if I go out and I take up a big rattlesnake and it bites me, I'm going to be poisoned. But these people at this time, these disciples at this time, didn't have the gospel that I have today. They didn't have what I have got here to live by. It says, notwithstanding, in this rejoice not. Don't be rejoicing that you can go out and do all these things. And you're not going to get, get harmed. So listen to this. Notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the Spirit are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. If you are a Christian today, your name is written in heaven. That's what you do need to be joyous about. That's what he's telling these 70. Be joyful that your name is written. Not that you can go out and you can tread on serpents or you can uh, uh, tread on scorpions or that you have power over the enemy. Don't be joyful for that, but be joy. And that's what the Christian should have today, the joy that your name is written in the book of life. How much greater can that be? God has the power to have it there for you. Jesus Christ has taken your name to God for you if you've done what he wanted you to do. And how do you do that? Through the mysteries that he's got in his word that he's given us. We can know assuredly that we can be with Christ. That we can be a child of God. As Brother Dan said a while ago, either good or either evil. Paul wrote the letter to the other, whether it's good or whether it's evil. Whatever you do, you're accountable for it. When you come to the age of accountability and you know how to read and you know how to find God's Word, you know how to get the mystery out of His Word. He's got it here for us. Am I going to know it all? No. There's no way I can know everything in this book. I'm not smart enough. But I will know what he needs me to know. I can ask my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to help me. And he will show me the mysteries in this book. That will make me the Christian that I need to be. He will give me that power that I need in order to abstain. Or abstain from the things that are enticing as we said up in verse 4. Be God you with enticing word. The world can entice me with a lot of things. And they have enticed me with things. Do I have to accept them? No. Can I uh, reject them? No, I can't on my own. I cannot do it. I've tried to do it on my own. I'm not able to. I fall to them. But through Jesus Christ, who strengthened me where all the power is at, I can withstand from those enticing words. I can restrain, restrain from those temptations that come upon me. I can do the good and not the evil. 
But I can't up on my own. And I've had different people tell me, well, I would be a Christian, but I'm just not good enough. <laughs> well, brother, let me tell you, I'm not good enough either. I'm still not good enough. But through the grace of God and through the mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I can live a Christian life. But not upon my own. It's up through Him who strengthens me. At this time, I want to stand and sing number 629. If you haven't got Jesus Christ in your heart, there's no doubt in my mind you've been told in this place how to become a Christian. You've heard His Word. You need to believe it. You need to repent. You need to confess. You need to be baptized. And you need to remain faithful. Right now, if you haven't done that yet, you've got to...